Number 15. Patrick Landers and Carla Backer During the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, 32-year-old American golfer Patrick Landers traveled from New York to Juarez for a visit with his girlfriend Carla Backer, who worked as a school teacher. He ended up staying far longer than planned after the Mexican government issued a stay-at-home order during the trip, landing the couple in lockdown for over a month. Their time together came to a disturbing end on April 20th of that year when they were both mercilessly gunned down while sitting on a busy street in Patrick's Jeep. Using three different caliber weapons, the shooters pumped between 20 and 30 bullets into the couple outside a cell phone store. Police were unable to determine a motive for the double murder and never arrested any suspects. Photos of the scene show that most of the shots seemed to be aimed at the passenger seat where Carla was sitting, but law enforcement refused to comment when asked whether they thought she was specifically targeted in the crime. The tragic slayings of Carla Backer and Patrick Landers were just two of over a hundred murders that had happened in the area since the stay-at-home order had taken effect. Juarez was already notorious for its high crime rates before the pandemic, and the problem only seemed to worsen during lockdown. For now, it remains unclear whether the couple was targeted or if they were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. Number 14. Claudia Ochoa Felix Nicknamed the Empress of Anthrax, Claudia Ochoa Felix was allegedly a high-ranking member of an assassin unit called Los Anthrax, which carried out hits for Joaquin El Chapo Guzman's infamous Sinaloa cartel. She was also a social media influencer known for being a Kim Kardashian lookalike and for showing off her luxurious lifestyle online. Ochoa Felix adamantly denied any gang involvement, insisting that the claims of her ties to organized crime were just rumors. The gossip about her being an assassin began after the 2013 arrest of the unit's leader, Jose Rodriguez Arashiga Gamboa. In September of 2019, Ochoa Felix was found dead at her home in Culiacan for an apparent drug overdose. But not everyone believes that her death was accidental, especially after she was seen going home with a mysterious man after attending a party the night before. The overnight guest called the police after waking up the next morning and finding Claudia unresponsive. Many people believe that the 35-year-old was murdered due to her alleged cartel affiliations, but if her death was the result of foul play, the authorities haven't admitted it to the public. Very little information has been released, leaving Claudia's life and death shrouded in mystery. Number 13. Maria del Carmen Lopez after decades of living and working in the United States, mother of seven Maria del Carmen Lopez retired from her career and moved back to her childhood home in the Mexican city of Colima. The 63-year-old was watering her outdoor plants one day in February 2023 when a van rushed up to the property. Three hooded passengers exited the vehicle and approached Maria, who fought back with all her strength as the trio dragged her to the van and forced her inside. Twelve hours later, the kidnappers contacted Maria's children in Southern California with a ransom demand, and to prove that she was still alive, they provided an audio clip of the retiree begging for her life. The captors wanted a far higher ransom payment than the family could obtain. They repeatedly tried to explain that they had no way of getting their hands on that much cash, but the kidnappers refused to budge on the amount. After a handful of phone calls, the abductors went radio silent and they haven't been heard from since, leaving Maria's children at a loss to locate their mother, and sadly they're unsure whether she's even still alive. A few months after the kidnapping, Mexican authorities arrested two suspects in connection with the case. But it failed to bring them any closer to finding Maria, who they believe was abducted by members of a kidnapping ring. The FBI is offering a reward for information leading to her return, but Maria's children have accused Mexican investigators of going silent. They've become their mother's biggest advocates and have worked tirelessly to ensure that the case isn't forgotten. Because Maria is a dual U.S. and Mexican citizen, the family is calling on authorities in both countries to get more involved and devote more resources to finding their mother. In the meantime, they're hoping that someone with information comes forward and shares what they know. Number 12. Wedding Day Bust a Mexican bride and her husband-to-be were arriving at a church to exchange their vows in December of 2023 when law enforcement descended on the scene and interrupted their planned nuptials. Known only to the public as Nancy Lizeth N., the bride was handcuffed in her wedding dress. She was arrested as part of a raid on a suspected extortion ring with connections to the La Familia Michoacana criminal organization. Nancy's groom, who goes by his nickname Raton or Mouse, managed to escape from the scene and has 
has been on the run ever since. The couple and several other suspects are accused of abducting four poultry shop employees and extorting chicken merchants in Toluca near Mexico City. After the arrests of Nancy and seven others in the wedding day raid, the group allegedly continued trying to extort merchants in a region where gangs were fighting over control of the poultry and egg trade. However, their efforts were thwarted by law enforcement, whose intervention has cost the warring gangs tens of millions of dollars in lost revenue. According to the most recent available updates on the case, the investigation is ongoing. In the meantime, Nancy has most likely traded her lacy white wedding gown for jail garb as she prepares to face the allegations against her in court. Number 11. Chris Cleave in early 2022, the owners of an upscale restaurant in a gated community near Cancun received a threatening note from local gang members. The ominous message warned the recipients that the people behind the threats were coming for them. It also targeted British expat Chris Cleave, who previously owned a restaurant in the area. The 54-year-old real estate agent from Cornwall had relocated to Mexico about a decade earlier. It was unclear why he was targeted in the note, but there was no reason to believe that he or the other recipients were involved in the drug trade or any other nefarious activity. Written on a cloth banner and signed Comandante Cobra, the note warned Cleve to shut his mouth before he found himself in a body bag. It also stated that the gated luxury community of Playa Car would become a prison for Cleve because people were waiting for him on the outside. Later that month, Cleve was fatally gunned down in broad daylight by two gunmen who followed him on a motorcycle after he left his home that morning. The culprits pulled up beside the red Audi at an intersection and shot him execution style through the driver's side window. Cleve's teenage daughter, who was in the vehicle at the time, was injured but survived. Police arrested two suspects aged 18 and 30, but unanswered questions continued to surround the case. Based on the evidence, it appeared as though the murder was linked to extortion attempts. Friends of Cleve said that he'd refused to pay bribes to gang members in order to get them to stop selling drugs at the restaurant during his involvement with the business. The murder came a year after Cleve's former business partner, 57-year-old Vitaly Fagin, was gunned down in a similar manner after resisting the same types of extortion attempts at the restaurant the men owned together. Cleve ended his involvement with the restaurant following Fagin's death, which remained unsolved at the time of Cleve's murder. Based on the similar circumstances between the cases, investigators suspected that both hits were ordered by the same person, or at least the same gang. Just weeks after Cleve was killed, his brother Nick told the Mirror that the suspects in custody were refusing to talk and that the investigation had ground to a standstill. Police had stopped updating the family on the case, and Nick blamed police corruption for the lack of progress, stating, half of them work for the cartels. As of January 2024, both Cleve and Fagan's murders appear to remain unsolved, leaving their loved ones on their own to come to terms with their losses. Number 10. Missing in Montemorelos in February 2023, 47-year-old Maritza Trinidad Perez Rios and her sister, 48-year-old Marina Perez Rios, left their homes in the small Texas border city of Penitas to sell clothes across the border at a flea market in Montemorelos. Accompanied by their friend, 53-year-old Dora Alicia Cervantes Science, the sisters had traveled to the state of Nueva Leon to sell their wares several times in the past. But something went terribly wrong this time, and the trio of U.S. citizens vanished on their way to the market. Marina's daughter, Maria Guadalupe Ramirez, told reporters that everything seemed fine when she FaceTimed with her mother earlier that day. The first inkling that something was wrong came when one of the women stopped communicating with her husband over the phone. After last hearing from his wife on a Friday and failing to reach her over the weekend, the husband filed a police report in Peñitas. Both the family and U.S. law enforcement reported the disappearance to Mexican authorities and pressured them to treat the situation with urgency. A few weeks later, Maria Ramirez told news station KRGV that the Chevy Silverado pickup truck the women were driving was last seen on surveillance footage in the municipality of China, roughly an hour's drive outside Montemorelos. The vehicle was seen making a wrong turn, but it's unclear where it went after that. There have been no updates on the case since March of 2023. Around that time, a relative told the Mirror that the family wasn't receiving updates from authorities, leaving the women's loved ones in the dark about where the investigation stood and if any progress was being made. The lack of communication caused the family member to wonder if law enforcement was truly doing everything it could to find the women. Unfortunately, it seems as though there have been no major developments 
so the case remains shrouded in mystery. Number 9. Philip Chandler After amassing a £40 million fortune throughout his career, British bookmaker and business owner Philip Chandler Sr. retired and moved to the city of Manzanillo on Mexico's Pacific coast with his wife Sharon. But the couple's golden years were tragically cut short in 2016, when Philip's fully clothed body was found submerged in a pool outside of his villa in the gated Oceanside community of La Punta. Investigators initially speculated that the 72-year-old had suffered a heart attack and had fallen into the pool, but his death was classified as an accidental drowning. It seemed odd to Chandler's son, Philip Jr., who knew that his father was a strong swimmer. In the absence of a medical examiner or foul play, it made no sense that he would have drowned in five feet of water. Philip Sr.'s wife, Sharon, was in Britain at the time of her husband's death and was quickly ruled out as a person of interest. Investigators said that there were no signs of foul play at the scene and that there were no visible injuries on Philip's body. Under Mexican law, bodies must be disposed of quickly due to the hot weather, so Philip Sr.'s body was cremated shortly after his death and there was no funeral. In 2018, Chandler Jr. told The Guardian that authorities gave him several different stories about what had happened. He claimed that they told him that there was alcohol in Philip Sr.'s system, but investigators later confirmed that the senior citizen was sober at the time of his death. The younger Chandler also heard other stories, including one about him falling and banging his head, and another about him tripping over his pet dog. He didn't know what to believe, and the conflicting and mysterious narratives caused him to wonder if foul play was involved. To get to the bottom of the mystery, he hung flyers offering a $50,000 reward for information about his dad's demise. Some locals didn't take too kindly to Chandler's mission. The flyers kept getting torn down, and at least one resident accused him of going on a witch hunt against his stepmother in an attempt to get his hands on his father's estate. He insisted that he just wanted to know how his father had died and to receive the half of Philip's estate that he was entitled to. But it's unclear whether Chandler ever got the answers he was looking for or if anyone ever collected on the award. Number 8. Dabani Escobar In 2022, an 18-year-old law student named Dabani Escobar vanished after being last seen along a desolate highway during the early morning hours. She'd gotten into an argument with her taxi driver after a night out partying and had exited the vehicle. But before leaving her there, the driver snapped a haunting photo of her standing by herself in the darkness. The last known surveillance footage of Dabani was captured near a trucking company property. Two weeks later, her body was found in an underground water tank at a nearby roadside motel. Dabani's death sparked widespread protests throughout Mexico, which has one of the world's highest rates of femicide. A staggering number of women also go missing. These murders and disappearances rarely get the attention they deserve by law enforcement, and oftentimes they go unsolved. At the time of Dabani's murder, there was a growing movement for justice in past cases and for authorities to take action to keep women safe. Just a week before she disappeared, the teen had attended a demonstration against Mexico's femicide problem, unaware that she was about to become the next statistic. An initial autopsy ruled that Dabani had accidentally drowned after tripping and hitting her head as she fell into the water tank. But a second autopsy carried out at her father's urging found obvious signs of an assault, including multiple injuries. The cause of death was then reclassified as resulting from a head injury. Dabani's murder remains unsolved and the case is fraught with unanswered questions. According to the young woman's friends, she was behaving erratically throughout the night. She argued with a friend at the party they attended together and the women left separately. After leaving Dabani by herself at the gathering, the friend called the taxi driver Juan David Cuella, who was off duty but agreed to pick her up. The nature of the argument between Dabani and Cuella is unclear, but police let him go after questioning. Based on the condition of Dabani's remains, a medical examiner estimated that she died three to five days before her body was found. And if that's true, it means she was alive for a number of days after her disappearance. But the case doesn't seem to be a priority among law enforcement and will most likely continue to go unsolved. Number 7. Elliot Blair In early 2023, police in the resort town of Rosarito Beach pulled over a vehicle driven by 33-year-old Elliot Blair, a public defender from California who was vacationing with his wife for their first anniversary. The officers accused him of rolling through a stop sign, but were willing to overlook the situation in exchange for a bribe. They also asked the couple where they were staying. 
Elliot wasn't carrying the amount of cash the officers kept saying they wanted, so he handed over the $160 he had on him at the time. His wife, Kimberly Williams, would later recall how nervous they felt during the traffic stop and how relieved they were when the police let them go. The couple returned to the resort where they were staying and went to bed around midnight. But two hours later, employees woke Kimberly up and told her that Elliot had fallen from the balcony of their third floor hotel room. She rushed outside to find her husband lying on the sidewalk in a t-shirt, underwear, and socks he'd worn to bed. Officials ruled Elliot's death an accident, noting that there was a large amount of alcohol in his system and no signs of a struggle in the hotel room. Kimberly had somehow slept through whatever happened, but she didn't believe her husband's death was accidental. She acknowledged that Elliot had drunk alcohol throughout the evening, but insisted that he was not intoxicated enough to accidentally fall off a balcony. Speaking with ABC News, Kimberly said that investigators discussed various theories with her about what might have happened. They even asked her if she and Elliot had argued that night, but they'd been getting along fine and had been enjoying their time together. The only theory detectives seemed unwilling to entertain was the possibility of foul play by an outside party. Kimberly hired a private expert to conduct a second autopsy, which found evidence inconsistent with an accidental fall. Based on the severity of Elliot's injuries, the expert who performed the autopsy theorized that he'd been assaulted by more than one attacker. But Mexican authorities were unwilling to budge on their findings or reopen the investigation, so the case remains closed. Since then, Kimberly has accepted that she may never find the answers she's looking for about what happened to her husband that night. She decided to focus on healing by honoring Elliot's memory. She now runs a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing scholarships for at risk youth and resources to people who have lost loved ones to tragedies in foreign countries. Number 6. Ariadna Lopez. In October 2022, a young woman named Ariadna Lopez was found dead along a highway in the state of Morelos after a night out with friends in Mexico City. State authorities quickly declared that she died from accidental alcohol poisoning and was dumped on the roadside by her friends. But the explanation didn't sit well with investigators in Mexico City, so they performed a second autopsy and concluded that Ariadna had been murdered, with the body showing clear signs of blunt force trauma to the head. During their efforts to retrace Ariadna's last hours alive, detectives learned that she'd gone to a bar with several friends. The group then proceeded to the apartment of a couple named Rautel and Vanessa, who lived about 10 blocks from the bar. Everyone except Ariadna left a short while later, making Rautel and Vanessa the last people to see her alive. The couple said that Ariadna had left after ordering an Uber and that they didn't know what happened after that. When the young woman's concerned friends pressed them for surveillance footage from their apartment building, they claimed that the video was erased every 24 hours and would therefore no longer be saved in the system. But law enforcement got their hands on the video, which appeared to show Rautel carrying Ariadna's lifeless body to his SUV. Phone evidence revealed that Rautel and Vanessa talked at length about the version of events they'd provide to Ariadna's suspicious friends, making it clear that they had something to hide. The pair are now facing charges in Ariadna's death, and state investigators are being accused of trying to cover up the murder. For now, the outcome of the case remains to be seen. Number 5. David Hartley 30-year-old David Hartley and his wife Tiffany were just a week away from their planned move to Colorado in 2010 when they decided to go jet skiing on Falcon Lake, a reservoir along the Rio Grande that straddles the US-Mexico border. They planned to snap some photos of a partially submerged church that was flooded during the creation of the man-made lake. But after crossing into Mexican waters on their jet skis, the couple noticed that they were being approached by three boats filled with armed men who began shooting in their direction. They attempted to flee, but one of the bullets struck David in the head, causing him to fall off his jet ski and into the water. Tiffany tried pulling David's body onto her jet ski, but she was unable to get him on the machine. Knowing that the gunmen were still nearby, she was left with no choice but to flee and leave her slain husband behind. She made it back to safety and called the police, who theorized that David's killers were working as lookouts for a cartel. The gunmen were most likely young and poorly trained, and had likely mistaken the Hartleys for members of a rival gang. David's body has never been found, despite extensive searches by authorities, and the suspects were never identified. 
Just weeks after the murder, the severed head of the Mexican detective assigned to the case was delivered to a military garrison in a suitcase. Investigators weren't sure if the two murders were linked, but it was certainly possible. After the detective was killed, the search for David's body and the investigation into his death were suspended indefinitely. In 2012, authorities arrested a Zetas drug cartel leader in connection with the case. But nothing ever came of it, and David's murder once again went cold. For years, Tiffany Hartley did everything in her power to try to get the case reopened. But she eventually accepted that the case would probably never be solved and moved on with her life. And while the case is officially still open, it seems unlikely that David's killer will ever be brought to justice. Number 4. John Patterson American diplomat John Patterson vanished one morning in 1974, just two months after he started working at the U.S. consulate in Hermosillo, Mexico. Several hours later, a note in his handwriting appeared at the consulate. It stated that a group called the People's Liberation Army of Mexico had abducted him and demanded a $500,000 ransom along with a news blackout. The note threatened that if word of Patterson's kidnapping was leaked to the public, the group would murder one U.S. official or a member of their family every week. Patterson was the seventh U.S. diplomat to be abducted in a little over a year, and then-President Ronald Reagan was determined not to cave to the mounting demands for money in exchange for the return of consular staff. He created a new law, making it illegal to negotiate with or concede to terrorists' demands, which meant that American officials had no plans to pay Patterson's captors. His wife, Andra, did everything she could to get him back, and when she couldn't stop the news from reporting on his kidnapping, she publicly apologized to the gang. She published newspaper ads pleading with the captors to contact her and offering the highest ransom she could afford. At one point, someone with a suspiciously American accent called the consulate and said to have Andra travel to a hotel to deliver the payment. She stayed there for seven days, but nobody came to collect the money. Some people believed the kidnapping was a hoax for this and other reasons, including the fact that nobody had ever heard of the People's Liberation Army of Mexico until Patterson vanished. The FBI eventually zeroed in on a suspect named Bobby Joe Kesey, who was staying at a hotel near the consulate when Patterson disappeared. Kesey admitted to writing at least one ransom demand letter, but maintained his innocence otherwise. But in the end, he took a plea deal and spent 11 years in prison for conspiracy to kidnap. Four months after Patterson went missing, a civilian discovered his decomposed body in the desert 345 miles north of Hermosillo. Sadly, his skull and back bore signs of repeated violent blows. But the circumstances surrounding his disappearance remain a mystery to this day. Number 3. Sharon Kinney in the 1950s and 60s, most American women were expected to spend their adulthoods as housewives and stay-at-home moms. Sharon Kinney adhered to those expectations by marrying a Mormon man named James and settling down in Independence, Missouri. But she and her husband both became bored with married life, and at some point, Sharon began having extramarital affairs. In 1960, James Kinney decided he wanted a divorce, which is heavily frowned upon in the Mormon faith. His family encouraged him to give his marriage one last last college try before he threw in the towel, so he agreed. But he was fatally shot in the head inside his home shortly thereafter. Sharon claimed that their young child had accidentally killed him without meaning to, which might have seemed like a plausible explanation at the time. But it became less believable when her married lover's pregnant wife, Patricia Jones, turned up dead two months later. Authorities took Sharon to trial three times for various charges. She was acquitted of murdering Patricia Jones. Then, in a separate trial, she was found guilty of killing her husband. But she successfully challenged her case and got her conviction overturned. Sharon's third trial ended in a hung jury, and in 1964, she fled to Mexico while out on bond and awaiting another trial, which was scheduled for the following month. Traveling under the name Jeanette Pugliese, she checked into a hotel with her new lover, Francis Samuel Pugliese, while posing as his wife. While out alone one night at a bar, she crossed paths with a Mexican-born American citizen named Francisco Paredes Ordonez. She pretended to be seduced by the man and agreed to go back to his hotel room, where she ended up fatally shooting him. When an employee overheard the commotion and came to the room to see what was going on, Sharon shot him in the shoulder. 
Sharon told police that she was at the hotel to see some photos that Ordinez had offered to show her and that she shot him in self-defense because he was making unwanted advances and refused to take no for an answer. She insisted that she didn't mean to kill the man and that she only meant to scare him, but the police believed that she'd intended to rob the victim and arrested her on suspicion of murder. Sharon was convicted of Ordinez's homicide and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. She appealed the conviction only to have it backfire when the court upheld the ruling and lengthened her prison sentence to 13 years. One evening in December of 1969, Sharon failed to be present during an evening count, but her absence wasn't officially noted until the next roll call several hours later. And to make matters even worse, prison staff failed to notify the police until 2 a.m., at which point a manhunt ensued throughout the city and at the country's major transportation hubs. Sharon was never seen or heard from again. Authorities had vowed to continue the manhunt until they found her, but they eventually admitted that it was a failed mission, and nearly 55 years after Sharon's escape, her fate remains a mystery. An investigation found that the prison was understaffed and had lacked security. There was also evidence that Sharon may have bribed guards to look the other way or possibly even to aid her in her escape. She may have also had help from outside parties, including family members and a Mexican policeman she dated in the past. All things considered, it's entirely possible that she went on to live a happy and enjoyable life on the lam and that she got away with killing not one person, but three. Number 2. Jose Arredondo On July 16, 2019, a housekeeper discovered the murdered body of her employer, American businessman Jose Arredondo, on the floor of his condo in Cabo San Lucas. It was evident based on his injuries, including his mutilated ear and the fingernail that had been ripped off, that the 60-year-old had been beaten and tortured. Two weeks later, authorities arrested Arredondo's longtime friend, Roberto Gonzalez, on suspicion of his murder. He was held in custody for 14 months until the case fell apart. The judge ruled that the evidence collection and storage methods had been flawed, resulting in a botched investigation. So, Gonzalez was eventually released. Since then, authorities have failed to update Arredondo's siblings and other surviving family members about any developments in the case, leaving them wondering if his murder is being covered up. An FBI spokesperson declined news station KGET's request for comment, but Arredondo's nephew Angel told the outlet that she wonders what the Mexican investigators are hiding. She also believes that American authorities should be doing more to investigate, not only because Arredondo was a U.S. citizen, but because she believes the answers about who killed him and why can be found in the United States, where he lived part-time. However, the U.S. Department of State said that it has offered appropriate assistance and can do no more at this time. The agency keeps telling the family and others to defer to Mexican local authorities for information, but they aren't talking. It's likely safe to assume that whoever killed Arredondo was motivated by money. At 11 years old, Arredondo moved to the United States with his family. They were poor and he got his start in the automobile industry by washing cars. He went on to become a car salesman, during which time he fell under the mentorship of a successful businessman. Arredondo eventually bought several car dealerships of his own, and one of his biggest priorities was to give back to the community through scholarships for students in need. Money can also bring bad things, and it's possible that Arredondo's success appealed to someone who wanted a piece of it that they weren't entitled to. Unfortunately for now, all his family can do is speculate about who took his life and why. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. Number one, Ben Corsa. 37-year-old British software engineer Ben Corsa moved to Mexico in January 2022, intending to start a new chapter in his life. Over the following several months, he lived in a few different places, but he eventually ended up in the western state of Colima, where he lived with a Mexican-American host family. Ben quickly befriended two young men who lived in a household named Claudio and Alfredo. However, his new chapter was cut short in one of the most tragic ways imaginable in June of that year, when he and his new friends were mercilessly gunned down outside a supermarket while sitting in a car. Sadly, they were all killed in the shooting. The tragedy came amid a spate of increased violence in Colima, but Ben was the first foreign national to fall victim to this particular wave of crime, which had claimed an estimated 400 lives by the time of his death. His family told the son that the identity of the killer and the motive behind the shooting were a mystery. They believed Ben, Claudio, and Alfredo were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
And like many other cases on today's list, nobody appears to have been arrested in connection with the triple murder. 9. Pokemon Go Officials in Arizona had arrested the parents of a two-year-old son after they allegedly abandoned him to play Pokemon Go. A neighbor noticed that the kid was trying to get inside the house, but no one was opening the door. The kid was barefoot and was only wearing a diaper and a t-shirt. He was crying his eyes out. When the deputies finally showed up, they broke in and one look at the family pictures displayed confirmed that the child did belong to the same house. One of the deputies had discovered a mobile number that seemed to belong to the child's father, 27-year-old Brent Daly. The officials called the number and notified the man that his child had been found abandoned. Brent Daly allegedly replied, whatever, and disconnected the call. Brent Daly and his wife, 25-year-old Brianne Daly, were said to have returned to their residence about an hour after the deputies arrived. The two initially claimed they were out to get gas for their car and had left the boy while he was asleep. However, the couple eventually confessed to driving around Santan Valley for more than one and a half hours, stopping at parks and other locations to play Pokemon Go. As per the Sheriff's Department, both parents were arrested for child neglect and reckless conduct. The child has since been put in the custody of Department of Child Services. After all, Neglecting a child under any circumstances is unacceptable, especially playing a stupid game. 8. Plastic Surgery In today's world, it's no surprise that teens are bombarded with toxic messages that equate self-worth with picture-perfect looks. Sadly, some parents push their children into believing the fake messages of the media that says they should look a certain way, making room for cultivating lower self-esteem and instilling a strong inferiority complex. Such parents expect children to live up to impossible expectations. One mother, labeled as the human Barbie, decided to assist her baby girl in overcoming her bodily insecurities by agreeing to pay for her $10,000 boob job. But here's the catch. Her child was only seven years old. Now who in their right mind would do this to a girl in the second grade? The mother stated that she did it because her child insisted on getting a boob job, liposuction, with some other cosmetic procedures to make herself look more visually appealing. The human Barbie apparently also taught her daughter to pole dance when she was just six years old. The mother sees no problem with what she did. We want to know who the doctors were that carried out the surgery. Without a doubt, going under the knife at such a young age while your body is still growing can have dangerous outcomes. Whether this was a case of a parent who gives in too easily or a parent who is indirectly pushing her child into what they expect of them is debatable. Whatever the case may be, this got way out of hand. 7. Behind the Wheel It's never a good idea to drink and drive. If somebody is going out for a few drinks, it's advisable to have a sober driver. However, this doesn't mean your nine-year-old child should take the wheel. A drunken man in Detroit let his nine-year-old daughter drive the vehicle while he sat in the passenger seat. Surprisingly, she turned out to be a competent driver, and no one was injured. However, it still does not justify the fact that the drunk man let her drive in the first place. In light of how dangerous things could have turned out to be, let's not forget that this is also absolutely illegal. How did the girl's feet even reach the pedals? When the cops pulled them over, she innocently questioned them saying, Why did you stop me? I was driving good. While the video of a sweet little girl trying to talk sense into an officer might look cute, the father was duly arrested. 6. Walmart Mom Walmart has a reputation for attracting some unusual types of customers with their large inventory and low prices. People have often referred to the franchise as a ghetto grocery. A bizarre incident was caught on camera. 
In the footage, you can see passing customers stopping to witness a fight take place. A mother, 34-year-old Amber Stevenson and 39-year-old Rebecca Mills, were seen hurling verbal insults at each other until things got violently physical. Supposedly, it all started when Amber confronted Mills after hearing the woman call an employee a racial slur, but no employees or video evidence backed up her claims. To make matters worse, after the first few punches were thrown, Amber calls out to her six-year-old son to help her beat up Mills saying, punch her in her effing face. The video shows the boy helping his mother punch and kick Mills as she is pinned on the ground. It's no wonder things were getting out of hand. Eventually, security and police got involved, breaking the fight up. While Mills received no charges, Amber was held on a misdemeanor and neglect charge. Turns out kids shouldn't be used as sidekicks in Walmart shampoo aisle fights. Who knew? 5. Medieval Parenting Some kids are punished by having their phone taken away, or TV privileges revoked, or being forced to do chores they normally wouldn't do. But one father from Seattle had an entirely different approach. His 16-year-old daughter had asked if she could go out for the night. Instead of just saying no and making her go to her room, he put on medieval armor and told her to fight him. And it wasn't a simple match either. Apparently, the fight continued until 4 a.m. Before the fight, he beat her with a wooden sword for two hours. The daughter didn't take this sitting down. After the ordeal, she took pictures of her bruises and contacted child services which promptly resulted in her father's arrest. 4. Digital When word spread that a three-month-old girl had died of starvation, news stories sprung up across the Pacific. Of course, the kid had parents, but the question is, where were they? It turns out that the parents did not even want to have a child in the first place, and the pregnancy was an accident. The parents didn't even have a job and couldn't cope with the aftermath of their actions, so they spent an entire day in an internet cafe playing computer games. The baby stayed at home all by herself, weeping and starving, but they didn't care, not a bit. If you thought this was ruthless, then wait till you hear what they did. They left their actual flesh and blood offspring to look after a child in a video game. A digital child. And the more time they invested in the digital kid, the less time they had for their actual one. This story has no redeeming qualities whatsoever. When the baby died alone and neglected, the parents attempted to avoid their troubles once more by choosing to flee the law. However, they were apprehended and accused of child abuse and neglect. As this unfortunate death was so closely associated with obsessive gaming, the case caused a nationwide uproar in South Korea. Today, gaming has taken a new form. In December 2010, a 19-year-old boy died after playing a video game for 12 hours straight. There was another incident where a 28-year-old man suffered a heart attack after playing an online game for over 50 hours. These are just a few examples. Studies show that over 2 million South Koreans are addicted to cyberspace. It is now regarded as a severe and lethal addiction. The government has issued a midnight curfew to block underaged gamers for a minimum of six hours in an attempt to curb the unsettling trend. 3. Foster Parents When seven-year-old Artyom Savelyev came to the city alone, Russian officials were called to a Moscow airport. The plane, which had just arrived from Tennessee, had flown the kid from the United States to Russia, all alone. The boy was brought to the Tennessee airport by his adoptive grandmother and quite literally dumped there. The boy's adoptive family asserted that he was unstable. They claimed that he was being sent away for the safety of the whole family. Onlookers never reported any dangerous tendencies that the boy may have had. Considering that he was left alone during the long plane journey across continents, 
the boy never showcased any disturbing behavior. On the contrary, nobody even took notice of it. The family, however, did not regard it as child abandonment since they left the child in the care of the hostess on the plane. They convinced themselves that she would look after the child regardless of her other duties on board. Artyom, the child, later told officers that his foster mother used to pull on his hair and throw fits around him regularly. Somebody in this situation was unstable, and it definitely wasn't the boy. After years of thought and consideration, Russia decided to prohibit all American parents from adopting orphans from Russia. While foster parents may not have any legal obligations towards the child in their care, it doesn't take away the fact that they are the only family that child looks up to. If you think you cannot handle adoption, don't even consider it. 2. Hot Car It was a hot and humid day, soaring at 81 degrees in Nassau County, New York. A couple parked their Mercedes-Benz around 2.30 p.m. before heading out to a mall to pick up some groceries. What might have been just another normal day soon took a horrific turn. Everything seems to be going fine, except for the fact that the couple had forgotten their 12-month-old baby, locked up and all alone in the car for almost one whole hour. A passerby happened to see the baby crying and wailing out loud in the car seat. On failing to open the car, she called 911 and alerted them of the situation. The poor child was visibly sweating and in great distress, possibly even suffocating from the lack of air within the hot car. Another Samaritan who happened to come across the commotion stepped in to help. He tried to unlock the car with a lockout kit. He tried multiple times, but failed. Finally, the officers arrived and they broke open the window, pulled the baby out of its car seat, and saved it from meeting a horrific end. The baby appeared to be flushed, exhausted, and profusely sweating. They immediately moved him to a store, gave him water, and tried to cool him off under the air conditioning. On further investigation, it was found that the parents, 28-year-old Lu Lu and 34-year-old Xing Kai Zhao, had left the baby in the car. It's a miracle that the baby escaped an untimely death. The parents were immediately arrested and charged with endangerment and with another additional charge of endangering the welfare of a child. The executive chief of the county, Laura Curran, said, it doesn't take a long time for a car to reach deadly hot temperatures on an 80 degree day, and it takes even less time for there to be a risk of heat stroke for children. What is wrong with people? 1. Abuse to pay the mortgage Raven Kiliana's parents would take her to a film studio when she was barely four years old. She was sexually abused in front of cameras for the majority of her childhood. It was the start of a 15-year ordeal in which Raven was routinely trafficked by her parents and other members of a systemized crime ring. What began from her residence in a middle-class suburb of the American Northwest spread to locations all over the U.S. and abroad. In those days, L.A. was a bustling hub full of film studios that provided numerous opportunities for the underground child abuse industry to thrive in the 1970s to 80s. Raven's father, who had recently lost his job, was always aggressive toward her younger brother. Still, Raven was given a particular status because she had become the family's breadwinner. Raven's value in the eyes of her abusers eventually decreased as she grew older. With age, the type of movies she was required to participate in became far more intense and aggressive. Nonetheless, she was raised to accept and rationalize the unjust treatment that her parents were throwing her way. In an interview, she said, I told myself that my parents meant well that what I was going through was what was necessary to help my family. It was paying our mortgage. Raven's history of abuse left a severe psychological impact on her adult life. She started to experience disassociative amnesia at a young age. 
It is a condition where distressing events of unavoidable trauma are blocked out, resulting in several gaps in memory. Raven has since struggled to break loose from her past and graduated from the puppetry course at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in London. Today, she uses her skills at puppetry to share her story without the prying eyes of the audience. One of her plays, titled Hooray for Hollywood, an autobiography that showcases the effects of child abuse on the child's mental and physical health, was critically acclaimed in Poland, France, and the UK. It was also made into a film that is used for public education and as a guiding material for professionals working for social services, education, and law enforcement. Although she has moved on, cut all ties with her parents, and made a new life for herself, she says that she still loves them and has forgiven them. However, the betrayal she was subjected to from the very people who were supposed to love and protect her will live on forever. Number 10. The Worst First Anniversary A man in New Hampshire got into a heated argument with his wife, who was roughly two decades younger than him. The argument took place in a small bus that they had converted into a traveling house. They used the bus as a camper for living and traveling while on the road. After the argument, the man returned to the actual house that he shared with his wife, only she wasn't with him. Joseph Ferlazzo, 41 years old, shot his wife Emily, only 22 years old, and then chopped up her body. Yes, it's just as gruesome as it sounds. Joseph killed his wife inside their Chevrolet Express bus in the middle of their vacation to Vermont. The couple took the vacation to celebrate their first year wedding anniversary, but the anniversary went terribly wrong. Joseph proved to be a complete psychopath. Joseph also did a very poor job of concealing his crime. Investigators found their camper with his wife's remains still inside and physical evidence of the brutal murder everywhere. According to the people close to the case, the couple had gotten married the previous October after being engaged for only a month. And despite Joseph admitting to the police what he had done, his attorney, William Kidney, has pleaded him not guilty. But he is guilty. He admitted it. Joseph told the police that he and his wife had gotten into an argument about the camper. She threw a temper tantrum and started punching and kicking him. This enraged the older man so severely that he grabbed a handgun, pinned her down on the bed, and shot her twice in the head. The next morning, he went for breakfast with his sister. Then he drove the bus 60 miles away and dumped it. Oh yeah, but before he left, he used a handsaw to cut off her feet, legs, arms, and head. And instead of trying to cover up his crime and dispose of the body parts, he just left them in trash bags inside the camper, not even bothering to throw them away. Number nine, psychopathic father. A father from Melbourne, Australia, killed his daughter and son-in-law in a chilling double murder. He committed the savage act on the first anniversary of their wedding. According to news sources, the father was angry because his daughter's husband never asked for permission to go ahead with the wedding. He brooded for a whole year before finally getting his bizarre revenge. On December 31st, 2019, Lindita Musai and her husband Vitan were executed on their doorstep. Lindita Musai's father, Osman, was the one who pulled the trigger. In February, he pleaded guilty to the double murder and is now looking at spending the rest of his life in prison. It was a pretty sad anniversary for the couple. In the hours before they were killed, they were celebrating at a local hotel. They caught an Uber back to their house, which they shared with Lindita's parents. At the same time, her father was driving around in his car aimlessly with an unregistered handgun loaded and ready to go in his seat. He drove back home at about 8.30 in the morning, but the couple hadn't come back yet. He drove around some more and returned at 10.30. The couple was about to walk inside the house. As they approached the front door, he came up behind them and shot each one in the back of the head. This is where he thought his story would end. He walked across the street to a park and shot himself in the face, but it didn't kill him. He was taken to the hospital and had the bullet extracted from his skull and his right eye surgically removed. He now has brain damage and will still have to spend the remainder of his life in jail. Number eight, 
killing the husband. Just one day before her wedding anniversary, Sandra Melger killed her husband. It was all part of a bizarre life insurance scheme for the Texas woman to get filthy rich while getting rid of her annoying husband at the same time. Sandra thought she was being clever when she staged a home invasion the night before their 32nd anniversary. She stabbed her husband Jamie 31 times, enough to make sure he was dead. Then she tied herself up and hid in a bedroom closet. This little act was supposed to convince police that robbers broke in, stabbed her husband, and left her tied but otherwise unharmed in the closet. When police investigated the crime, they saw it did not match Sandra's story. And when they learned about the life insurance policy she had on her husband for $500,000, all the pieces fell into place. She was sentenced to 27 years in jail. When the judge read the verdict of guilty, she put her hands over her face and howled like a wolf. That was the moment she realized she made a big mistake. All those plans, all those sleepless nights dreaming about how she would spend the money, all turned sour in her mouth as she screamed. Number seven, the cruise from hell. Kenneth Manzanares was the man from Utah who got sentenced to 30 years in prison for killing his wife in 2017. He took his wife on a cruise to Alaska as part of their wedding anniversary. Not only did he bring his wife on this trip, but their three daughters and extended family all traveled with them. They departed to Seattle, bound for Alaska, but everything turned bad one evening when they got into an argument. Christy, his wife, finally admitted that she wanted a divorce. She didn't care if it was their wedding anniversary. She was done with this guy. She demanded that he get off the boat at the next stop and go home to Utah by himself. The argument happened while two of their daughters were in the room. Kenneth calmly asked them to leave, and when they were gone, he started beating his wife. The daughters heard the shouting and ran back in the room to save their mother, but it was too late. She was already dead. Kenneth then turned his attention to them. He tried to throw one of his daughters off the balcony, but was stopped at the last second when his brother-in-law ran into the room and saved the day. It was arguably the worst cruise ever, and Kenneth was arrested and taken to jail as soon as they made their next stop. Recently, Kenneth was discovered dead in his prison cell. Do you think Kenneth being found dead in prison is karma for what he did to his family? Let us know your thoughts on this terrifying case in the comments below. And don't forget to hit subscribe before the end of the video. Number 6. Bludgeoned After 17 Years Upinder Paul Gilt and his mistress, Gupreet Renault, have been found guilty in a Canadian court for their horrifying murder of Gil's wife back in 2014. They were found guilty in 2016 as well, but had the convictions overturned on an appeal. They had to have their second trial at which point they were found guilty yet again. The murder happened on January 29, 2014. Jagtar Gill was discovered inside her home in Ottawa, dead from being stabbed and beaten. It was her 17th anniversary to her husband and she had been recovering from hernia surgery. And yet at the same time, her husband was seeing a different woman. He'd been seeing her for years and it was time for them to get rid of the one person in their way, Gill's wife. The plot was disturbing. The murderers waited until the day after Jagtar had her hernia surgery. They thought she would be the most vulnerable when she was in pain, disoriented, and on drugs. It was Renault herself, the mistress, who committed the murder. She stabbed Jagtar over 25 times and inflicted 20 injuries by blunt force. The husband was around, but he didn't physically do the killing. He simply planned everything and then tried to help them get away with it. But it didn't work and now both are stuck in jail forever. Number five, hit and run anniversary. Juliana Moore is the widow of a wealthy British businessman who died in a hit and run incident in Ukraine. The tragedy happened as the couple was celebrating their first wedding anniversary together. His name was Barry Pring and the vehicle that struck him caused injuries so severe that he died later on in the hospital. Barry was struck by a car with a stolen license plate as he stood outside a restaurant in Kiev with his wife. This was on February 16, 2008. The couple had gotten married the year before. After meeting online, Juliana had made an account on one of those European wife finder websites. She managed to snag herself a wealthy man almost 20 years older than her. For Juliana, it was a big success. But here's the thing. 
She may have plotted the murder to get rid of her husband and take his money. She denies all these accusations. Still, it's been alleged that she hired somebody to run her husband over and make it look like an accident. It doesn't help that the police were unable to find the killer, making it impossible to prove. There was an investigation, but simply not enough proof to charge Juliana with any kind of crime. Number four, an Irish boating trip. Stephen McKinney from Ireland killed his wife during a boating trip that they took to the Irish countryside to celebrate their wedding anniversary. His wife, Lou Na McKinney, was originally from China, but fell in love with an Irishman, as the song goes. They had a nice little family together with two children. Stephen hired a boat for three nights as a treat for all of them and to celebrate their anniversary. The couple moored on a secluded part of Devonish Island and spent the evening with their kids, having a few drinks and playing Monopoly. According to Stephen, Lou Na got up in the middle of the night to check on the boat because she thought it was moving. She couldn't swim, and so when she slipped and fell into the water, she wound up drowning. But this isn't actually what happened. Police found inconsistencies that led to Stephen being charged with the murder. When he called the police, he claimed that he couldn't find his wife to get her out of the water. But when the police arrived, they could clearly see her body floating right beside the shore. This was obviously a lie. He also tried to tell the police that they had a happy marriage, but investigators discovered his wife had been trying to get a divorce for the past three months. It also turned out that Stephen was controlling, manipulative, and coercive. Police even discovered that he had taken a final creepy photograph of his wife, asleep, as a token to remember her by. Minutes after taking that last picture, he drowned her in the lake. In the end, it was clear that he murdered her on purpose. The jury took less than two hours to find him guilty of murder. The court sentenced him to a maximum of 20 years in prison. Number three, incurable road rage. A man in North Carolina was so consumed with road rage that he shot a mother of six to death. This woman, Judy Everly, was from Mannheim in Pennsylvania. She was on a trip celebrating her wedding anniversary when she had the unfortunate luck of bumping into Dejuan Floyd on the road. Her husband Ryan was behind the wheel of their GMC Yukon. He accidentally cut off the driver of another vehicle on Interstate 95 South. His accidental cutoff forced the vehicle onto the shoulder. It was an accident and everyone should have just moved on with their lives. Instead, Dejuan, so angry that he had been cut off, followed the couple pulled up next to their window and fired his gun into their car. His bullet only hit Julie, killing the mom and leaving her children with only one parent. Number two, the death of the animal. WWE's road warrior animal died while trying to have a romantic getaway with his wife for their wedding anniversary. His real name is Joseph Laurinaitis. Joseph was with his wife Kimberly at the Margaritaville Lake Resorts in Missouri. He had organized a romantic evening for them, which began with a fancy dinner and ended with them returning to their room. He had spread rose petals on the sheets and put out a gift basket. Everything just looked great, but once they were in the room and things started to heat up, the road warrior animal collapsed on the bed. His wife shrieked and tried to perform CPR, but Joseph died right there in front of her. The coroner reported that he died of a heart attack. It was just 10 days after his 60th birthday when he perished, gasping for air, on a bed of rose petals. And number one, unsolved mystery in Cancun. A firefighter from Texas who was celebrating his wedding anniversary with a trip to a Mexican resort was found dead. Elijah Snow was a firefighter in Arlington. He went to Cancun with his wife Jamie for an all-inclusive week of fun in the sun. But the trip wasn't that fun considering Elijah was discovered dead with his body stuck in a hotel bathroom window. On Monday night, the couple were at the hotel bar. Jamie returned to their room and Elijah stayed behind to have some drinks. When Jamie woke up at four o'clock in the morning, Elijah still hadn't returned and she contacted the authorities. Mexican police found him several miles away from the hotel he was staying with his wife in a different hotel stuck in the window. The coroner said he died from mechanical asphyxiation. Mexican officials said it was just an accident, yet nobody knows what he was doing in the hotel, who he was with, or why in the world he tried to climb through the window. His family is positive Elijah was murdered. They don't have proof, but they have hired their own private investigator to look into the case. 
It just makes no sense that he abandoned his wife on their anniversary to go to a random hotel. It makes even less sense that he accidentally died trying to escape through the window. Number 10. Dead in Cancun What should have been the romantic getaway of a lifetime for a Washington woman turned into the last trip she would ever take. Sativa Transu was on her second day of fun and sun in Cancun, Mexico, when she began sending her family members some pretty bizarre messages. On Friday, she messaged her sister, saying that she wasn't really having a good time, but she was enjoying the warmth. That night, she texted other friends and said that she had been injured during an argument that she had with her boyfriend and had to go to a Mexican doctor to get stitches. Everything went downhill from there. As you can probably guess, having to get stitches on vacation because a violent rumble really takes the romance out of it. The boyfriend, 31-year-old Taylor Allen, had already exhibited disturbing behavior before the two went on vacation together. This is according to what Sativa's family has told investigators. Apparently, they already knew that he was violent and dangerous. Sadly, shortly after Sativa got stitches, her father received the last phone call any parent wants to receive. It was his ex-wife informing him that his daughter had been discovered dead in her hotel room in Mexico, beaten to death. Mexican authorities immediately took Alan into custody. The only silver lining here is that at least Alan got caught and will be facing justice the Mexican way. Number 9. The Supplier Holly Sheridan Connors was only 24 years old when she died in the early hours of January 1, 2019. Hours before she died, she got engaged to her boyfriend. But her boyfriend wasn't the best influence on her. In fact, he was the reason she died. He supplied her with the very drugs that took her life. When the police checked what she had in her system, they found cocaine, diazepam, and GHB. For those unfamiliar, these are three drugs people don't usually do at the same time especially the last one. GHB is the drug in roofies that makes it easy to kidnap and do stuff to people. Holly had traveled to North Wales with Ryan Lee Weston, a guy she'd been seeing on and off again for quite some time. They had rekindled their relationship a few weeks prior and thought a romantic getaway would be nice for both of them. When they arrived at their destination, Glan Egro Lakeside Suites, they started drinking rather heavily. Then the boyfriend pulled out his great big bag of drugs Within just a few hours, Holly was dead on the floor of the suite. Ryan was given 21 months in jail for supplying Holly with the drugs that killed her, but wasn't found guilty of any kind of manslaughter. Number 8. Four Useless Lungs Nathaniel Holmes and Cynthia Day, a couple from Maryland, were discovered dead inside their hotel room. They had traveled to the Dominican Republic for a romantic getaway, but both died from respiratory failure before either could seek help. They were actually supposed to go home the very day they were found dead at the Bahia Principe Hotel. There were no signs of violence, although officials did discover a small pharmacy of drugs used for treating high blood pressure. An autopsy revealed that the couple both died from respiratory failure and pulmonary edema. What this means is that they had some kind of mysterious lung injury which led to fluid leaking from their lungs in spaces that should have been filled with air. They must have sat down in the room after a long day of rest and relaxation at the hotel, then coincidentally suffered from respiratory failure, were unable to get enough oxygen to breathe, and dropped dead. What's really wild is that they both died from the same thing at the exact same time, with neither of them having the strength to reach the phone to call for help. Number 7. A Savage Beating A mom from Delaware was on a romantic vacation with her husband in the Dominican Republic when she wound up on the wrong side of a savage beating. Tammy Lawrence Daly nearly died when she was assaulted by a figure in the night. She was left with her nose broken, her hand fractured, hearing loss in her left ear, and her mouth ripped open as if she'd been mauled by a vampire. The terrible tragedy unfolded at the Majestic Elegant Resort in Punta Cana. Not only was Tammy there for some romance with her husband, they were also joined by some of their married friends. But when Tammy went off on her own at night, a man crept from the shadows, attacked her from behind, and then dragged her down a set of stairs and pulled her into a crawl space. The unidentified man then closed the crawl space door behind them and proceeded to beat and assault her. When he had finished what he had set out to do, he left Tammy in the crawl space to die. The only silver lining is that Tammy was beaten so effectively that, to this day, 
she doesn't remember what happened. She drifted in and out of consciousness with very little recollection of what transpired over the next eight hours. She was finally rescued the next morning when she regained consciousness and managed to scream for help until someone finally found her. According to what Tammy said in an interview after returning back home to the US, the one thing her assailant took that she could never get back is her smile. Her sense of humor is dead. Her smile is gone and she'll never look at a stranger the same way again. Does this tragic case make you more nervous about your next Caribbean vacation? Let us know your thoughts in the comments and don't forget to hit subscribe before the end of the video. Number 6. The Woman Who Drowned Her Husband Lori Eisenberg is going to spend the rest of her life in prison. Why? She killed her husband. She pleaded guilty to the killing of Larry Eisenberg back in February, becoming a murderer in her late 60s. The killing was all part of a bizarre scheme to prevent Larry from learning that Lori had embezzled over half a million dollars from her employer. To really add insult to injury, Lori killed her husband on a romantic boating trip. They went to Lake Coeur d'Alene in Idaho, with Larry having no idea it would be the last trip he ever took. Lori claimed that her husband fell overboard while checking the stolen motor. She failed to rescue him and then stayed in the boat for two hours because she didn't want to leave the area where he fell in. She claimed that she never called the police because she thought that her husband sank with his phone still in his pocket. The cops eventually found Larry's body floating in the lake. They thought Lori's story was suspicious, but there wasn't much they could do right away. It wasn't until they did the autopsy that they found evidence of murder. Larry had lethal levels of Benadryl in his system. It was then pretty obvious that Lori poisoned her husband with a Benadryl spike drink before pushing him into the lake and watching him drown. Lori received life in prison for the murder. But what's really shocking is that she did it after 30 long years of what was supposedly a happy marriage. He had dedicated his life to Lori, and in return, she embezzled a ton of money, then killed him so that he couldn't have any of it. Number 5. Romance in a Sarasota Hotel A man from Port Charlotte is facing a murder charge following the shooting of his romantic partner. According to Sarasota police, a man was discovered dead at a hotel near the Sarasota Brandonton International Airport. The victim's name is being withheld for privacy reasons, but we do know the name of the man that killed him. The assailant is Brennan Wakey, only 25 years old. The Charlotte County Sheriff's Office caught him during a traffic stop and brought him in for murder. He and the victim, a local transient, had been involved in a bizarre romantic relationship. Their romantic getaway to the Hyatt Place Hotel may not have been as luxurious as a getaway to the Bahamas, but it was all they could afford. It's not exactly clear what went wrong during their stay, but the day after they checked in, housekeeping discovered the victim lying on the floor near the bathroom with a gunshot wound to his face and mouth. The police then discovered two 45 caliber shell casings on the floor nearby. Surveillance footage from nearby showed the couple going to a nearby McDonald's for a romantic two-can-dine dinner, then returning to the hotel room. At about 3 o'clock in the morning, the same video camera captured the killer walking out of the hotel with a handgun tucked in his waistband. Sometime between the Big Mac and the early hours of the morning, their romance turned sour. Number 4. Death on Death Road Brittany Hallman and Emil Vollenhoven packed their suitcases and traveled to South America for what was supposed to be the trip of their lives. For three months, they went from site to site, crossing all the most beautiful places off their bucket list. Brittany thought Emile was going to propose to her before the vacation was through, but as they were cycling in Bolivia, driving over one of the most dangerous mountain roads in the world, tragedy struck. They were cycling across Death Road, a place that really earned its name. Emile got a little too close to the edge of the road. His bike went over the precipice, and he fell 300 feet to his death on the forest floor below. The romantic adventure was over. They had traveled through Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Peru, but never made it past Bolivia. They were supposed to keep going through Colombia, then fly to Canada for a ski trip. Brittany is positive he was waiting for the ski trip to ask her to marry him, but sadly never made it that far. Number 3. Rekindling a Troubled Marriage Stephen Heritzko booked a romantic holiday for himself and his wife in a desperate attempt to fix their troubled marriage. The getaway was scheduled for Valentine's Day 1998. The weekend would feature a dinner theater murder mystery at the famous Harbortown Resort on Maryland's East Shore. Stephen really believed that the romantic weekend alone would rekindle the flames of desire between him and his wife Kimberly. At 1.30 in the morning, 
Kimberly walked into the hotel lobby and told an employee that her room was on fire. The employee quickly ran down to the cottage where Kimberly was staying and discovered a man lying unconscious on the floor with smoke and fire billowing out of the cottage windows. The employee ran to the rescue and dragged the man out of the burning cabin. It was Stephen, terribly burned and already dead. When questioned by the police, Kimberly said everything started out fine. They went to the murder mystery, then returned to the room and watched a movie. Stephen had been drinking a lot and trying to get frisky. She said no. They got into an argument, and she left the room and went for a drive. When she came back, the room was filled with smoke, and she couldn't go inside. She figured Stephen had gotten too drunk and fell asleep with a lit cigar, igniting himself and the room. But there were a few pieces of the puzzle that didn't fit. When family and friends were questioned, they all agreed that Steve never smoked. He hated it. And then, when the firefighters went through the destruction of the cottage, they discovered an accelerant had been used to start the fire. Suspicion soon turned to Kimberly. After a lengthy investigation, the police learned that she used a drug called succinylcholine to paralyze him. This is a powerful muscle relaxant used in surgeries. Then, once he was paralyzed, she doused him with lighter fluid, set him on fire, and watched as the flesh melted off his bones. Number 2. Insecticides at the Hotel Kaylin Null and her boyfriend Tom Schwander were on a romantic vacation to the Dominican Republic when they became terribly ill. They were staying at the same hotel as the couple we talked about earlier, the ones that had both died from sudden respiratory failure. And while I said earlier how the couple's death really seemed like a freak accident, Kaylin and Tom's story may shed some disturbing light on what really happened. They were on vacation for 13 days, but it was on the sixth day that they woke up and both suffered pounding headaches. They went for breakfast, then returned to the room and found that there was an overwhelming chemical smell. They called the front desk for help, and a hotel manager arrived and gave them an air cleaner to help with the smell. But when that wasn't satisfactory, the couple demanded to change rooms. Changing rooms didn't help. The couple continued to get worse and worse. They had stomach cramps and diarrhea, and even started to bleed from their butts. They cancelled their trip and flew home early. When they went to their family doctor, he told them that they had been exposed to chemicals found in pesticides. The couple now believes they became violently ill because insecticides had spread through the air conditioning system and poisoned them in their sleep. And this would explain what happened to the couple previously, who died from lung failure. They were poisoned at night. However, nobody has actually been able to prove this yet, despite a pending lawsuit against the hotel. Number 1. A Deadly Fall A romantic getaway in Luxembourg turned into an unimaginable day of terror when a woman fell to her death. Her name was Zoe Snokes, and she was posing for a selfie on a cliff in the small village of Nardine at the edge of the Orth River. Zoe was 33 years old, on vacation with her husband, Joeri. Since the pandemic, Zoe and her husband have been driving across Europe in their van, exploring in the only way possible for them. They got married back in 2012. They brought their dogs on the road trip with them, and it was the most romantic time of their lives. While everybody else was suffering from lockdowns, these guys were driving around Europe, checking out all the amazing sights to see. But the fun has to stop somewhere. The couple had gotten up early in the morning to climb to the top of the cliff and take photographs. They arrived just shy of 9am. Zoe asked Joeri to watch the dogs for a second when they reached the summit. He turned around and grabbed the pups, and when he turned back, his wife was gone. She had been standing on the edge, and then she was, well, not there anymore. He says it must have happened in about 5 seconds. He never saw or heard anything, not even a scream. He just looked up, and she was gone. As it turned out, Zoe had been trying to take a photo when she walked straight off the cliff, plummeted 100 feet to the hard ground below, and died on impact. Would you rather vacation in a beautiful place that's been experiencing a violent crime surge or in a relatively boring but extremely safe destination? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.